I'm the least knowledgeable person reading today and the least knowledgeable person in the, uh, in the book because I'm not an art historian. Uh, I'm just a creative writer, but when I got this commission, um, I had some awareness of Nano Reed, and the way I went into it was mostly through biography and my own time spent living in the area and a sort of overlap of themes, I think, with, with Reed's work. But I'll just let it speak for itself. I'm going to read the essay, and it's called Chaos Magic. In my mid-twenties, I went to stay with my mother and stepfather to ride out a protracted personal crisis. They'd moved to Mornington at the mouth of the Boyne, a place I did not know well, and the walking route I took in the cold fire of anxiety every day brought me down to a mound-like graveyard at the edge of the estuary. Like many old burial places in Ireland, this one lies in the leavings of a pre-modern chapel, beached on a hillock at Donacarney and broken apart like a shipwreck. It was late summer, humid and still, with the smell of the estuary, mud flats and sandbanks veined by tidal marks, eggy and oppressive. Everyone knows this is a steeply haunted spot. The Boyne Valley has simply been inhabited, settled for so long. What the poet Leanne Quinn describes as a prehistory of refuse seems to thicken it with bones and pollen and charged carbon and portal tombs, with earthworks and sudden drops to the underworld. I remember myself suspended in a purgatorial glare as I walked by the estuary in the evenings, and especially at the slightly purple onset of twilight, when the water was low and the air softly rotten, moving only with oyster catchers and moths. It seems trite to me to describe a landscape as healing, largely because it sounds benign. Recovery from collapse involves a trial by fire passage from one state to another, a transformation that obliterates the person you used to be, rather than any recuperative return to a previous life. Also, the landscape of the Boyne Valley is chaotic, atmospherically speaking, that is. Perhaps there are people who don't feel this, but I doubt it. Have you ever met anyone placid from Kells? <laughs> Nano Reed was born in Drada in 1900. I was born there too, though I grew up in County Dublin. As a teenager, I cleaned tables in a Meath hotel with a chef who blasted the water boys a lot, meaning my soundtrack to that time is Glastonbury song. Caught the bus at the ferry fort, made it to the mansion on the Boyne. On Friday nights, I did my homework in the snug of a pub some family ran in Slane, as an old man told a story about saving barrels of whiskey from the river in his youth. The barrels fell somehow, and the community of Slane, he insisted, summoned him by name. I got the call, he would begin. He retold the story every week. In truth, I spent some of the most difficult years of my adolescence in this part of the world, when my parents had separated suddenly and my life was stretched between places. Winter weeknights were spent driving down narrow back roads and turning abruptly into the salt-lit Fata Morgana of new housing estates, thrown up with rude abruptness at the height of the building boom. When I stayed with my father in Delique, another broken open abbey church gave off a psychic vehemence that invaded my dreams, the drive there passed a smoky slip road near Bective, so haunted that ectoplasm seemed to gather in the ditches after dark, and we would lock every pin of the car on approach. It's difficult to disentangle a personal mythology throbbing with mood and colour from this antic landscape, which is already itself throbbing, and the overlap of emotional history and dinshanicus, or spirit of place, produces an opacity of affect that is painterly, textural in itself. Muddy is also the first word I read in relation to Reed's work. I came across her paintings for the first time, <clears throat> briefly and it seemed without much significance, in the British Library. This was years and emotional epochs on from the life in Dulic, Drogheda, Kells, Clane, Slane, Julianstown, Terman Fecken. I was a student in London trying to write about atmosphere, specifically Irish atmosphere, or Ireland as atmosphere, some hanging quasi-substance, airborne, contagious, clinging maybe to the lungs. Reed's muddily mystical paintings meant she was among the artist Tom Duddy in 1987, defended as responding to an intuitively insular understanding of Irishness in modern art, as opposed, that is, to the outward-facing, market-oriented work of artists catering to perceptions of Ireland as picture, to Ireland as exotic, as object. I looked up Reed. The picture came up swinging. It was Cave of the Fearbug. Ordering everything on Ireland I could find from the bottomless, imperiously rich catacombs of the library, I even came upon a Kells publication. The original brochure of plans and specifications for Bungalow Bliss. 
Another framing device, I thought. People wake every day and look at landscape, look at Ireland, through the candid standardisation of the picture window. A house backing onto a vacancy, an empty field in Dalik. St Mary's Abbey beyond this, lasered with light at night, where semi-melted faces remain carved in the ancient tower. I don't think that a painting like Cave of the Firbolg feels ambassadorial Irish at all. This category seems arbitrary. Where the mystical shows up as mud in Reed's work, it is as a medium in which intensely intimate and therefore weirdly universal energies reside. The cave lurches out of the painting at an angle that is cinematic, slanted in what feels like a gesture of playful derangement, the visual equivalent perhaps of a shrieking violin. A scaffold squares the portal off, but it is still oval, a coarse mandorla, a gash of black. There are corbelled stones and horses, but everything our attention is drawn to this dark centre of emphatically vaginal gravity. There's an insularity to this which is not provincial. On the contrary, it is psychically extreme. The cave recurs in ancient caves, scratched this time like radio static, into an otherwise plush or at least broad-stroked impressionist and cumulative scenario. Tower, tiller and clouds, which in reverse look like a human nude. The cave this time shrieks for itself, etched around and around by lines cut into the paint and suggestive of briars or wires or a nervous system. But again, the black drop, the portal, is somehow scarily animate, foreboding. The mansion on the Boyne is an anteroom, a Taj Mahal. The horses graze, the figure in the foreground tends and the magnetic portal to purgatory pulses luridly away. When the magic mounds of Meath were excavated, Reed lost interest in them. The valley was, she felt, now like a doll ripped open by a curious child. The painter's desire in squaring up to the cave is less to derive information than produce a compound of viewer and view. The mud or the blood or the paint is a substance between body and earth, its thickness invoking prehensility. In a poem which addresses Cave of the Firbolg, Quinn interprets the cave as a heart independently exsanguinating itself. The heart beats even though we don't ask it to. The body subsides into the earth. The awesome autonomy of the organ, the landscape, the symbol endures unthinkingly, a matter of matter, not mind. I started my first novel there in Mornington with an image that melted out of it eventually, as many things do with the first draft. This image was a white moth flushing upwards from some growth at the edge of the river. It opened, the moth, I wrote, it opened greyly against a backdrop of sulfuric low tide, the evening like a sealed sick room. The little opportunity opened, death mouth, shroud, and flickered across the water towards, I decided, some unthought porch light at the opposite side of the estuary. I send my love along the Boyne. That night the weather broke and I opened my window to listen to the lucre of the rain. Or it was not that night, it was another night, the one long, steep, dilated night of deep time that makes a place like this hum if you can pick up the frequency. If you require landscapes and backdrops, wrote Leonardo da Vinci, look at damp stains or stones of uneven colour. You will see rocks, ruins, mountains, battles, likenesses and inspiration. It is the same, he explained, as the sound of bells in which one detects a cacophony of actual words. Away from the magic mud of substance and intuition, there is a cultural scene. Reed, who was not especially taken by Paris or London, a private and ornery woman who doesn't seem to have cultivated any personal mythologies, can be found in the midst of a tentative salon culture on Fitzwilliam Square in the late 1940s. She has lodgers of consequence. She's promoted by Liam O'Flaherty and Thomas McGreevy. This is a time and place in which dourness is the overriding aesthetic. Writers and artists fall in and out of intellectual pubs or depart for the continent or threaten to depart for the continent. Reed's sodden lushness is slightly at odds with it, but her legendary prickliness and her refusal fits. There's a link in pictures that brings me to this from the soupy spirit sinking over Bective to the thinking circles of Dublin to the now. When I finally published the novel begun on a mothy twilight at Mornington, the cover featured an image of a work by the artist Patrick Swift, a painting of his girlfriend, Claire McAllister, and people wrote to tell me all about Claire, red-headed, American, rich. There's a story of her bringing Reed to see some early works by her boyfriend in her apartment sometime in the 50s. I picture the young woman pulling canvases from a stack, clapping them together, leaning one after the other against the wall with the best light. In my mind, it's a winter morning. 
Swift, a fan of Reed, had praised her in his own writing and absorbed her influence. Reed was unimpressed, however, by his work and tactless about it. My love for this particular picture of Claire, the one on the cover of the book, is partly a matter of matter too. Like all of Swift's portrait, it has the cold and private glamour created by a slightly non-figurative flatness, a surface quality that declares itself to be the work of a painter, someone's interaction, someone's close attention, someone's body, and not a mimetic reproduction or a piece of technology, even as it moves towards photorealism. Matter. But terrible, says Reed. My own life in Dublin. A boyfriend takes me to visit a house where they have several Swifts and many many gelets and white stag works and maybe even a Paul Henry. No reads. Irish art and Irish life at this elite end feels like a coterie. Reed's absence is punishing, provincial. She felt unappreciated in Drada and yet did not, it seems, network obligingly in Dublin or become something melting into money, recomposing as a picture on a wall. Gellet's work is bright and clear as a bell. Reed's landscapes remain igneous. The boyfriend and I sit up looking at a coffee table book about Dublin's Georgian townhouses. There are sketches and photographs of neoclassical drawing rooms, Masonic lintels, elegant squares, plaster fruit effusing from creamy ceilings that have been generously restored. We find the houses we are in and try to see who lived here when the street was fashionable. Solicitors and seasonal visitors from lost or forgotten country seats of the old Irish Parliament squires and second wives found in British holiday towns, a widow writing to her daughter after 1800, it has lately become a noisome slum. We agree that the buildings are gorgeous, but the people are unbelievably dull. At Mornington, the Maiden Tower, a piece of Norman infrastructure crumbling attractively into billowing grass, anticipates the pungent obelisk to Wellington in the Phoenix Park. Bold colonial ogre impulse to commemorate Arthur Wellesley Second Baron Mornington. Boyfriend knows actual residual Wellesleys. I know the gestalt of the tower and the intermittently mirrored tidal flats. In the morning, I imagine myself in a crinoline as my heels ring beneath me on the Georgian pavement, tilting away from the Georgian gate to King's Inns, making for the coffee machine in Spar. The boyfriend messages later to tell me a man stopped him on the same ringing pavement and pointed at one placid window saying, my 10 siblings and myself were born and grew up in that room. A house backing onto a vacancy, an empty field in Delique, St. Mary's Abbey beyond this lasered with light at night where semi-melted faces remain carved into the ancient tower, a picture window. In the rotund wing of a ducal palace, Leinster House, there are bog bodies, part of the National Museum's collection. I remember when old Crohan Man was found, half sliced with disarming neatness by farm machinery, in a field in Offaly in 2003. I went in to see the bodies on the train. I felt Connie Clavin Man, the bent-necked redhead with the James Dean quiff, reminded me of a boy I liked. He was murdered. All bog bodies are murder victims, relics and metaphors. All bog bodies, are, but we will never know why, nor if there is anything, if there is meaning to his lost nipples or his elaborate hairstyle. Up close, the poignant, vulnerable narrowness of the defleshed jaw is less striking. Connie Cavan man's skin, twisted and resettled as it rested around his crushed spine, has the polished quality of vellum, of a toy horse made from leather I had as a child. He also comes from near Baliver, if I'm pronouncing that right, in Meath. Seemingly smashed up, he is less humanoid and less relatable than other bog bodies. But the shining torso and the red dye of the peat, centuries of quiet seepage into cells and sinews while whatever meaning his death might have held for his community, ritual or vindictive, seeped away. This is deep time, the realness of a dream. We stand in the presence of meaning, of semiosis, some response is demanded, but there will be no final meaning. We will never know what bowls of bone chips, solstice light boxes, dolmens like godly dinner tables mean. Possibilities go on and on. Entire alternative forms of order, organisation and interpretation have been and gone. We remember them subconsciously. Ancient land has a handle on this, I think. A late, abstract and apparently aerial dreamscape gridding spaces out with dark, almost volcanic colour tones. 
The red square slithers slightly with a shape. It might be an outline or a stamp in red wax. And there are skulls lurking on the periphery, a square of layered light at the top that's treated, leathery, polished, light reflecting as the earthy, hennid flesh of Connie Cavan Man. At this point in her painting career, Reed is moving intuitively. It looks as muddily cantilevered as a close-up of a bird's feather, but ordered like an ordnance survey map. There is peaty compression, but also a suggestion of the abstract, almost medieval space logic she uses sometimes. Everything gathered together in the architecturally, arbitrarily architectural limits of the canvas. This can happen in daytime too. The springy, cartoonishly useful mise-en-scene of Mellophon Abbey, which is by Gerard Dillon, and it's in this room, arranges slabs and tombstones, fussoirs and towers and bricolage, another cave tunnel gaping merrily in the background, amount marvellous archetypal figures like an aureal tarot card. Spaces might be inserted like the altar panels or tympana, littered about the picture instead. There's light. There are visitor centres, days of sunshine, a chalky brightness illuminating even the coffin lid that coils with spiral of life carvings. Something thistly flowers in the foreground heraldically. You can see through this canvas, its thinness is, ge is gelat-esque, but I prefer the moody hummus compacted in, in Nano's ancient land, a picture with gravity. The only splash of light in this picture, the yellow white above the square of red, glints as if sun is flashing off the surface of something worn glassy smooth with use. <clears throat> A house backing onto a vacancy, an empty field in Delic, St. Mary's Abbey beyond this lasered with light at night where semi-melted faces remain carved into the ancient tower. A picture window. My sister and I are visiting the house where my father lives with his new partner and her children. There are stepsisters screaming over hair straighteners and all the frippery, all the debris of a naughty girlhood. Christina Aguilera pounds on repeat from a ghetto blaster downstairs, dirty as another stepsister prepares for competitive Kaylee by whitening her knee socks in the utility sink with bleach. There's a moment on every winter weekend visit when we stand at this picture window in this room, staring onto the empty space interceding between us and the salt light of the churchyard. And every time my sister says, something is going on with that field, it's haunted. We have this idea that the field is full of eyes. Presences hover over the ground frost, some kind of assembly or assemblage of interested parties flock there after dark, glaring collectively with rage or maybe curiosity at this latest settlement of semi-detached houses that are painted within the bland and cooling, creamy colours of cheesecake. At the bottom of the banister, there's a bulb of polished pine. The house remembers neoclassical drawing rooms, masonic lintels, plaster fruit effusing only dimly, much like my body might murkily remember bent-necked retribution, tribal certainties, bog burial. Every winter weekend, we descend on Friday night to eat takeaway food at the huge pine table, wrestle Diet Coke from a bale encased in clear plastic, pass through the bleach-smelling anteroom to deliver the rest of the bale back to its storage hollow at the side of the house where it's cold. Things I remember from this time, a pendant with a nub of scented soap in the centre, my blue school bag, a pair of Mary Janes I starred with 3D stickers, the bulbous buttery television remote, flattened out like the precise stepless and deathless flowers painted in a carpet in the backdrop of the Annunciation by Fra Angelico. But I remember the window intensely, curtainless, perversely energised. It did nothing to stop the wild substance of the landscape invading the room, linking the new settlement to the ancient one through the bonding bridge of a dark and empty electromagnetic square. It would glow all night like an animal that sleeps with open eyes. <laughs>